Did you notice that this show doesn't have any commercials? I'm not selling you diapers or vitamins or smoothies or gasoline. That's because I don't want corporate sponsors telling us what to investigate and what to say. Instead, you're our sponsors. This is a production by our nonprofit, the Informed Consent Action Network. If you want more investigations, more hard-hitting news, if you want the truth, go to ICanDecide.org and donate now. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are out there in the world. It's time for us all to step out onto the high wire. Well, I'll tell you, I'm getting really super excited for the Defeat the Mandates rally. It's happening in Los Angeles coming up this Sunday. Uh, behind the scenes, you just can't imagine what it takes to put on something like this. Nonprofits involved in medical freedom all across the country, working hand in hand, tirelessly, you know, there were moments where even the permit itself was hanging in the balance, all sorts of uh, James Bond moments, sending people into top-level meetings, trying to get someone to help us get approval. But as it's turned out, we're permitted. This thing is happening. Beautiful people I know are, are making their plans to travel with their families. Going to have stuff for the kids there. We know it's going to be a long day, but it's going to be fun. Beautiful weather predicted. I mean, this is just... It's just stacking up to be something fantastic. We've all been burning the midnight oil, uh, trying to help each other out and make it everything can be. And so it's almost here. Um, and so we're going to be talking about a little bit of that today, especially, you know, all of those involved. Many great speakers from all walks of life uh, in, in that discussion. But when we think about this rally and why I think it's so important, you know, there's been moments. And we're reflecting all week on sort of those sea change moments uh, in, in, that have happened in this movement um, that really sort of defined moments where we shifted into a whole uh, different place. And I think this is going to be one of the, those moments. In, in Washington, D.C., which was the first Defeat the Mandates rally that took place just a few months ago, uh, when we were there, I've talked about it, just this amazing turnout. And really, what shifted was the media around it. All of a sudden, we were no longer this fringe group. They finally, it was, it was almost like the news actually was believing its own hype. That they were right, the vaccine was great, well, it wasn't so great, well, it's not that good, it's good enough, oh, well, a couple boosters. You, we watched the descending narrative on that crappy product that they all supported. Uh, but it was well, standing there and seeing all those people, the media finally was saying, this isn't a fringe group, folks. We have underestimated what's taking place here. This is a movement. And shortly after that, polls started showing drops in confidence in the government, drops in confidence in the Biden administration, in the Democratic Party. And I'm not going to make this political. It shouldn't be political. This is about all of our freedom. But all of a sudden, the White House started releasing its grip on us, realizing that they had to make a shift. I, you know, when we think about Hollywood, though, this is the propaganda machine of the world. I mean, we just celebrated the Academy Awards. I didn't watch a single inch of it, not even the slap, so I'm not going to talk about it. But the point being that, you know, Hollywood is what has been puking out this, this disgusting narrative in all of their television shows, in the news, in the media, and in being a part of Hollywood. You know how many people, you know, are in there that are, you know, sharing ideas. They eat good food. They're not vaccinating their kids, or at least they're living healthy lives that haven't been allowed to speak. And so when I saw the headlines that were starting to pop out around, you know, Disney and, and all the, here, here's some of the Netflix to require COVID vaccinations for actors and other Zone A personnel on its U.S. production. Zone A, just so you know, is all the people like on set, like that are interacting with each other. Everyone's going to have to be vaccinated whether you like it or not. Now it's going to booster shots. They all have to have booster shots. They're all having to wear masks in the L.A. sun all last summer if they wanted to work. Uh, I think we had another one here. Disney to mandate COVID-19 vaccinations for all U.S. staffers. Um, it was just mandatory COVID-19 vaccinations can be required on set for film and TV productions. 
And so imagine, you know, your whole industry. We've all have different walks of life and different jobs that have been forcing this on us. But this is where our media is coming from, which is why it's so important that this rally is taking place, I say, in the belly of the beast. It's certainly in the belly of the propaganda machine known as Hollywood. I know there's a lot of people in there that are afraid to speak. We've been reaching out to many of them. We've got some great people lining up to talk. But you wouldn't, it's just amazing how terrified actors and directors and people in Hollywood are to even broach this subject, even on a phone. It's like they, they, they feel like the phone's being tapped. Um, and so I wanted to get to the bottom of that and have an understanding for it. Um, one of our great friends, Lee Allen Baker, um, has an amazing career going. So this is what your career looks like uh, in front of the cameras when there's no COVID around. And good luck, Charlie. You were hilarious. Did they let you ad lib a little bit? Did they let you be yourself? Yeah, no, I ad libbed a lot. My camera's rolling. They can't stop my freedom. Right? What are they going to do? What is it like being a mom in real life and then like, having your own family and coming here and having another family? Well, it's great because whenever I'm sick of one family, I can just go to the next. I think that I'm a lot of fun at home. My kid thinks I'm the bomb diggity. Things don't go smoothly for the Duncans when it comes to delivering babies. Let's just say that. Baby's coming. Yeah, we got to get mom to the hospital. Come on, honey, get in the car. Oh! I just finished executive producing and starring in a movie for Disney Channel, which is released this Friday the 13th. Dashing through the snow in a one-horse open sleigh. Oh, the fears we go laughing all the way. <laughs> I remember watching one episode where you were like, you were somehow in like a breakdown scene, Buster Move situation. <laughs> yes. And I was like, yes, you go. I often find myself in those situations. <laughs> what would be next on your list of like dreams of things to achieve? Well, I think my biggest dream is, is uh, doing all of that while having a family and, and two kids and a, and a happy relationship with my husband. And so to me, um, I don't feel the need to push the envelope. I'm, I'm happy executive producing and acting and, and being a mom. Yeah, and happy as long as you keep your mouth shut and keep doing what you're told and stay off of the topics that matter. Of course, Lee Allen Baker got herself in a lot of trouble speaking the truth, and this is her at a couple of school board meetings. I was canceled last July already for telling Joe Biden that masks aren't law, but they're an overreaching suggestion. Former Disney Channel star Lee Allen Baker was among the individuals who gathered to criticize the mask mandate at a school district in Franklin, Tennessee. Actress Lee Allen Baker was among a group of anti-maskers who protested a Franklin, Tennessee school district's decision to reinstate a mask mandate for local elementary grade students. Dramatic video of a school board meeting on mask mandates descending into chaos. <laughs> learning that one anti-masker at the meeting in Tennessee is a former Disney star. My name's Lee Allen Baker and I'm a California refugee. I gave up everything there, a really successful Hollywood career, television shows, gave it all up for freedom. Her anti-masker stance raised the roof. There are these books that I have and I have them as a gift for you, the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights and the Federalist Papers and also the Bible, and these guarantee my freedom and yours and our children's to breathe Time. oxygen. Amen to that. So, uh, some good reading there. Everyone in Hollywood, it should be mandated. I'm joined now by Lee Allen Baker. Uh, first of all, thank you for joining us and taking time to, to, to hang out with us today. So good to see you, Dale. So, Hollywood, tell me about it. You've been in there quite a while. I mean, it's a great gig. It's a great place, good people. But as soon as this sort of oppression came down, you know, what happened to the vibe of Hollywood? Well, you know, Hollywood and Disney in particular is the place where dreams come true until your kids almost die of a vaccine injury. And then right. you're cut off. You know, it, it, it's so interesting to me because, you you know, I, against my better judgment, did my part. I vaccinated my children. It not only didn't work out for us, it was detrimental for us. And I actually thought I would be met with compassion, uh, but I was not. I have been painted as a murderer, an anti-masker, an anti-vaxxer, a domestic terrorist. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous at this point. Uh, yeah. I don't even know what to say. Obviously the phone calls stop. 
Um, you know, I did text the head of Disney Channel, who I really love and I've worked with for years and said, yeah. you know, I understand that this means we will never be working together again, but I just wanted you to hear my stance. And, and the response was, we wish you the best. Yeah. That was kind of what I got from some of the people as I've reached back to the doctors was, you know, great work. You're doing your thing. We're not happy with it. Good luck with all that. I mean, and, and that's how yeah. it goes. So for these actors, and, and I've talked a lot of them, I have a lot of friends in Hollywood that many of them totally on our side, but will not at all step in front of a camera, will not talk about it. And, and it's understandable, right? You're immediately, they just, they just jump all over you to try and scare everybody else. But uh, when you, what is it that keeps actors and, and, and directors from using that, that talent, that ability to tell the truth? What, what keeps them from doing it? So they're afraid that they're going to lose everything. One of the big problems it, that hurts people, and this is what hurt my feelings the most, was when I said masks aren't law, I was labeled as a racist who think black lives don't matter. So anyone who knows me and knows my heart knows that that's the most ridiculous statement. I was also labeled as transphobic and a gay basher. I mean, I had death threats on me and my children. So I think people are so afraid that cultural revolution. I mean, it is a it is a strategic tactic to instill yeah. hate and, you know, cause wars and cause division and strife. And so I think that they have just such great fear of that. And they're afraid of losing their jobs and their livelihood. And I get it. But I'm more afraid of losing my children. I'm more afraid of them killing my kids and killing me with these mandates. So, you know, you have to weigh what is most important. And those beautiful faces right there, like that is what is most important to me. Like when they yeah. say to me, you will have to get the shot. When I say it's a hard no, I mean, like, I'll pitch a tent in the woods and live. Like, if they right. say you can't get a driver's license, I start looking at my neighbor's horses thinking, hey, we could go places. Yeah, fantastic. Well, and, and that's what it's all about. I think that's why we're all here. And, you know, it's true. I mean, it, in some ways we can get frustrated uh, with those in Hollywood. But because you're so visible, there's a lot of people that speak out. Maybe they mess up a relationship between them and someone in their family. But when an actor or somebody famous speaks out and, and speaks the truth, all of media descends upon them. All the crazy people out there are now all over your, you know, social media platforms. And then just beyond just losing your job, the things that are said about you, threats to your family, your kids have to see it. So it really is. It, it, I think it just adds to, you know, like here, here's one of the, the tweets. Hey, babe, just want to let you know that, well, how do I say this? You dumb blank anti-vax dumb bum go. You get the whole idea. I'm not even going to go any further into that. Those are the types of things that you have to put up with. Um, but you have stepped out and, and you did speak the truth. How did that feel? How did it feel at that school board meeting? Uh, because there's a power to the fact that you're recognizable. There's a lot of great voices, I'm sure, that, that were there that day. But when you spoke, it, it has impact. What did that feel like? Well, it was really shocking to me, Dell, because I've spoken at four school board meetings in Los Angeles at the Los Angeles Unified School District, and no one cared, and it wasn't a peep wasn't heard anywhere. Mm. Um, that's because I feel like California, they feel like they're winning the game in California. But Williamson County, they this is a hotbed for them wanting to take it over. And when I stood up and spoke, you know, I didn't even have makeup on that day. Like, I, I had no idea this thing was going to be filmed and certainly didn't <laughs> think it was going to go viral. It was a right. last minute clutch decision for me to go to this. My kids don't even go to that school. I homeschool. Right. Um, so <laughs> it just goes to show you that there's a real fight for yeah. um, middle America because middle America is not playing this game. So I, I think there's going to be tens of thousands of people this Sunday. Um, you're putting together, you know, a statement for the group that's out there. How important is it? What do you think effect this could have on Hollywood and Los Angeles and politics? Just in your mind, as you think about when we watch television, we see tens of thousands of people taking a Sunday afternoon to stand together for freedom. Does it make a difference? Well, I mean, we're all going to be on the domestic terrorist list, so just prepare yourself for that. <laughs> um, you know, I'm, there's nothing terrorizing about me, and there's really not much domestic about me. You can ask my husband. Um, <laughs> but I do think that it will make people come together and question. I mean, just it's been so taboo to even ask questions about this medical product. Why is this the only medical product on the planet that definitely has a side effect of death? It's proven and it even, they admit it. That's why there's no liability for it. 
you know, why are we not allowed to ask questions for it? I think that when people come together, it's going to just hopefully embolden more people. I mean, this is the hill. If actors and actresses are sitting around thinking that, oh, eventually I'll come out, this is it. Like, this is your chance. This yeah. is the hill. It's time to step up. I agree, because if not, then it's over for you. It's over for your kids. California is on the verge of absolutely sinking. It's why we're all rushing there. Never leave a state behind. We can't let California fall. Ten horrific bills. Some of them are already being put on hold. We're having some effect. So psyched that you're part of Defeat the Mandates. But this hasn't really even been an end to your career. You have a great movie uh, coming up, which we're really excited about. Just tell me about that so that we can at least give you a plug for, for being brave, beyond just being a great actress, funny, putting out great material. Now you are a freedom fighter and still putting up movies. So tell me about uh, Family Camp. So this movie, I had gotten this movie before uh, COVID was introduced and before it was pushed upon us. And so I was always going to be going to do this movie. They had shut it down. And then Oklahoma happened to be the first state to open. Now they tried to stop me from doing this movie. Screen Actors Guild sent out a blast to every single person in the union saying that they were not going to make this a SAG signatory. They were refusing to return their phone calls, refusing to fill out paperwork, just basically making it impossible to make it a SAG film. So I said, no problem. I'll go FICOR. So actors, there's this thing that you can do called going FICOR to where you can do both union and non-union films. And this film was so good with such reputable companies that I knew I was going to do this movie and they were not going to stop me. So fantastic. it's a fantastic, family-friendly, faith-based movie that is full of laughter. It's the first Christian comedy ever. And right. what I love about it is that it sets the table for everybody to enjoy this movie, whether you're a Christian or not. All right. Well, we're looking forward to it coming out in May. Everybody, make sure you that we support those that are out there telling the truth and keeping their career together. Lee Allen Baker, you're fantastic. Uh, you're a hero. And I want to thank you so much for joining us with the Defeat the Mandates and joining us today. Uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Dale. All right. Take care. All right, well, it's Defeat the Mandates. I'm going to keep hitting it. If you have any questions about where it is or, you know, how do I get there or how long is it going to be, what's happening, just go to DefeatTheMandatesUS.com. Please share this with everyone you know. Definitely just repeat that website because a lot of people get confused. The information is there, DefeatTheMandatesUS.com. Let everyone you know this is going to be the event of the century. Um, so many people coming together to make this happen, so we're really excited. I'm excited about the rest of this show. I got Joel Aylworth coming up. He's going to talk about what it meant to get kicked out of law enforcement uh, for not taking the vaccine. What does that mean for the future of law enforcement and our safety in America? Jamel Hawley, a politician in New Jersey that was there during the huge uh, rally we had, one of those, those turning point moments, we're calling it the second battle of Trenton. I'm going to talk to him about about what it means in politics to see people come together. And then hopefully Pierre Corey, uh, one of the great doctors from FLCCC, is, is, is flying right now. If we're lucky, he may get to tap in with us in a, in a stopover uh, in an airport somewhere. Either way, a lot to celebrate. And then we're going to, uh, another one of those powerful stories. So many people throughout of this pandemic talked about the inability to get to loved ones that were suffering inside of hospitals, whether they elderly or friends or they had COVID, couldn't get to them. Some of them passed away without anyone around them. Uh, one of This is one of those stories, a situation happening in hospitals all across this country that must stop. It's criminal. Uh, this is one of the most unbelievable stories you're ever going to hear. We're going to talk to that family coming up. But first, it's time for the Jackson Report. All right, Jeffrey Jackson, you can feel it. You can feel it in the air, man. This is going to be a big historic week. Um, but before we week. get to Los Angeles, what's happening in the world? Yeah, thanks, Dell. Well, let's let's talk um, some interesting data that just came out of the CDC. It has a lot of people talking and to set this up. It is so important. We have to go back to July of 2021 to then CDC director Robert Redfield. He went on an interview and he said some very interesting things. Take a listen. All right. There has been another cost that we've seen, particularly in high schools. Uh, we're seeing, uh, sadly, far greater suicides now than we are deaths from COVID. 
we're seeing far greater deaths from drug overdose uh, that are above excess than what we had as background than we are seeing deaths from COVID. Yeah, so, I remember talking what, about that. So where are we at now? Yeah, yeah so w the CDC just released a report. It's in their MMWR. That's kind of like their in-house science uh, journal. We've covered so many stories on there. It's been highly politicized uh, d during this uh, during this COVID pandemic, but these are the results of the lockdowns. We're talking lockdowns here. Mental health, suicidality, and connective, uh, connectedness among high school students during the COVID-19 pandemic. This is a survey in the United States from January to June of 2021. What did they find? This Again, this is the CDC's re journal reporting this. They found this. Overall, 37.1% of students experienced poor mental health during the pandemic. It also goes on to say, in addition, during the 12 months before the survey that was still locked down, 44.2% experienced persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness, 199 had seriously considered attempting suicide, 9% had attempted suicide. These are horrific numbers, Dell. And you know, we, we, we bang on this. I, I know it's not, it's not happy news to talk about, but my yeah. gosh. So how, do, how could we have seen this coming? Well, we have this, the actual CDC director, Robert Redford, signaling this in July yeah. of 2021. But even before that, we have the, the signatories on October 25th, 2020, the Great Barrington Declaration, literally in their first three sentences of the declaration, they found it was yeah. so important, they put this, the Great Barrington Declaration, as infectious disease epidemiologists and public health scientists, we have grave concern about the damaging physical and mental health impacts of the prevailing COVID-19 policies. They were seeing all the lockdown policies going and they said, the results to name a few include de deteriorating mental health, leading to greater excess mortality in years to come with the working class and younger members of society carrying the heaviest, heaviest burden. Keeping students out of school is a grave injustice. And that's what Redfield was talking about in that clip. He was saying, we need to open in these schools, we need to find common ground because this is what's happening now. And this is what the Great Barrington Declaration signatories were, were said what was going to happen. And, and looking now at that, you know, Jeffrey, just to interject really quickly, remember we covered and, and you, you know, covered the fact that when that Great Barrington Declaration came out and in, in, in the face of, you know, Rochelle Walensky now touring the world and saying, hey, the science is gray. When we said we're following the science, it didn't mean it was black and white. We were just finding our way. It changes. Well, if that was the case, why weren't you open mm -hmm. to the Great Barrington Declaration? And instead of bringing those epidemiologists and world-renowned scientists to the table to have a conversation to see if there would be more casualties from this decision, instead we had reported that the head of the NIH, Francis Collins, in an email that was captured in a FOIA request, showed that he immediately said, we need to take these people out, destroy them, basically. The, the sweet right. old Francis Collins that plays banjo like Kermit the Frog was out there trying to destroy scientists that were warning us of an epidemic of suicide and depression, amongst other things that would be caused by measures that, as they said, would not work. And now, where are we at? Did they work? Absolutely not. And remember, Francis Collins was calling for a quick and devastating takedown. Those were his words of right. three fringe epidemiologists of the Great Barrington Declaration. That was to Tony Fauci. Tony Fauci immediately went on the news. He was the mastermind behind, between, uh, behind articles. He was the attack dog that yeah. tried to shut this, this, this conversation down. So now we see headlines that look like this, this side of the UK. Why more and more experts say lockdown didn't prevent people from dying and call it a monumental mistake on a global scale. And remember this study, this is out of Johns Hopkins, uh, a literature review, a meta-analysis meta of the effects of lockdowns on COVID-19 mortality. This was just at the beginning of 2022, this was re released, the, basically the most comprehensive look at lockdowns. It says this, while the, this meta-analysis concludes that lockdowns have had little to no public health effects, they have imposed enormous economic and social costs where they have been adopted. In consequence, Lockdown policies are ill-founded and should be rejected as a pandemic policy instrument. They go on to say these costs to society must be compared to the benefits of lockdown, which our meta-analysis has shown are marginal at best. Such a standard benefit cost calculation leads to a strong conclusion. Lockdown should be rejected out of hand as a pandemic policy instrument. And why are we talking about this? Well, we're seeing, you know, drum drum beats around the world. Del, you and I talked for yeah. the show here. Uh, Shanghai is locking down 25 million of its residents. Uh, you know, it's, it's not quite clear that this COVID thing is really in the past and lockdowns are in the past. So we need to keep hammering this home. But right. just, just to cap this segment off, literally the number one uh, 
uh, I'm not going to call him architect, but uh, Tony Fauci, the, the, the cheerleader for these lockdowns in the media throughout the last two years, he was recently interviewed and asked about them. Hold on to your socks. Listen to what he had to say. I'm interested in your reluctance to use the word lockdown. Do you think two years on that they were worth it or were they too severe? You know, I don't think we're ever going to be able to determine what the right balance is. I think the restrictions, if you want to use that word, which I tend to shy away from, lockdown, they certainly prevented a lot of infections, prevented a lot of hospitalizations, and prevented a lot of deaths. There's no doubt about that. Obviously, when you do have that kind of restriction on society, there are unintended negative consequences, particularly in children who are not allowed to go to school, in the psychological and mental health aspects it has on children, in the economic stress that it puts on society in general, on individual families. Obviously, those are negative consequences that are unintended. I mean, he's even, mm. you know, half right there when he says, I mean, there's no doubt they worked. In fact, Johns Hopkins, uh, John Ioannidis, every study, meta-analysis of all the studies around the world are showing, as they said right there, John Hopkins, negligible if at all. So there were not, there were no benefits. There was only negative effects by this. And yet he's out there, at least he's admitting we'll never really know. Uh, a good scientist should be able to know. Good data collection would have led us to those answers. And this entire heaping, steaming, stinking mess that was caused by Anthony Fauci, the fact that we have to listen to this guy anymore in the news at all, it's astounding. If anyone out there, I'm sure you're not watching my show, think this guy is a hero, just <laughs> I'll have you know, I will never give up until I see that man in prison. <laughs> you don't have your little Fauci candle burning right no, off camera there? No, I don't. I don't. No. <laughs> All right. Well, so you're talking about. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you're release, talking about data. Yes, it says da uh, data, data releases. Let's switch to vaccines, Pfizer's vaccine. And specifically, uh, our, our ICANN's attorney, Aaron Siri, uh, he was uh, uh, working the case for public health and medical professionals for transparency. Yeah. This is a doctor's group trying to get the Pfizer documents that they collected and gave to the FDA for their, right. their post-authorization and their serious adverse events monitoring. And if we remember, we covered this in December of 2021. That was the first kind of installment of these documents that were received. And Pfizer at that time and the FDA at that time said, we're going to need basically 75 years to release all those documents. Well, as right. we know, that that uh, has been pared down and they're releasing tens of thousands a month. So this is what so we then, received. And then, by the way, I mean, just for people that are brand new to the show, many of you know this, uh, Aaron Siri fought them, you know, fought the appeal. They tried to have 75 years. They have one year to release all the data. Uh, so it's just it's starting to pour in these giant document dumps. So continue right. on. Yeah. Yeah. And it's an astonishing story. Just that piece alone. Pfizer tried to interject in the trial. It is incredible. So we received this document at the time. Uh, this was a, a cumulative analysis of post authorization adverse events reports of the Pfizer vaccine. It's received through 28 of February 2021. Now, this is a report prepared by Pfizer for the FDA. This was in their internal documents. Yeah. And if you, if you look in this report, uh, it says here Pfizer has also taken uh, a multi uh, multiple actions to help alleviate the large increase of adverse event reports. This includes significant technology enhancements and process and workflow solutions, as well as increasing the number of data entry and case processing colleagues. To date, Pfizer has onboarded approximately, and we have a redacted number there, additional full-time employees. More are joining each month with an expected total of more than, again, redacted additional resource, resources by the end of June 2021. So this is well, how we received it. They were redacting the number, meaning, I mean, first of all, like, this is so stupid on their part. You might as well just cite off fire, you know, fireworks. Just shoot out of that spot on your email. Like, <laughs> wait a minute. What's that? Right. Why are you hiding that from me? What is there to hide? As though somehow right. you probably would glass, maybe you would have glassed over it. Right. But no, they draw attention to it because why are you hiding it from us? Right. Thousands of pages of documents. That's a great point. And remember, right. in those documents, we've learned that there was over 42,000 re relevant cases of reported adverse events, right. 25, over 25,000 nervous system disorders. So we're thinking maybe, you know, maybe they already had a good group of people. They onboarded maybe 10, 20 people, maybe even 50. Well, they have been unredacted now. So we have the new documents in the latest dump. And this is what it looks like. Same paragraph, unredacted. 600 additional full-time employees. Wow. More are joining each month 
month with an expected total of more than 1,800 additional resources by the end of June 2021. 1,800 new employees are expected to go through just these adverse events that they've found when this thing hit the market with an e uh, emergency use authorization. Wow. And, and to think, you know, you could say, well, that's a small number. If it's a small number, why did they hide it? They obviously know that looks terrible. And for a company and for the FDA and everybody that's just been screaming how safe this is. And no, we have no evidence that people are dying or really having the, the, the adverse effects are minor. They're just, you know, some swelling and some light fevers. Obviously, it was a big deal. They had to hire an army to try and handle it. Uh, and now we know because Aaron Siri wouldn't give up, right? He said, you're not redacting. I mean, yes. I love this about the work that we do, and people don't get this. A lot of times we don't report until we've got the first draft, then they redact it, then you go back, and, and the, the law firm basically has to say, why is this redacted? Is it, how is this such private information that is going to somehow, you know, hurt the company or hurt the FDA? This is, this is inside, like this is top secret information. What's top secret about it? They end up having to give it up and say, you're right, it's not top secret. It's just a very embarrassing and disturbing number. Amazing. Such an amazing revelation. I want to remind everybody, you would have known this first, even before today, if you're on our newsletter. All you have to do is be signed up right now, thehighwire.com. It's right there on the first page. You just scroll down to it. Put your email in there. There are things that break. Some of them we don't even get to on this show that are huge deals, but you can be on top of it and say, oh my God, look what they just discovered. It's a great party trick if you're going off to a dinner and it's available to you for free. So take, you know, avail yourself of one of the greatest we tools we provide here at the high wire it's evidence evidence to our point and everyone on the newsletter gets those legal updates before anyone else in the world sees it so amazing it's an amazing discovery this week and let's stick with uh, sp speaking of more information on the vaccines let's stick with this now remember we we had this back and forth and it's really still going on uh, for natural immunity it wasn't really recognized by public health officials right. fauci said well that's a good idea maybe we should look into this at some time well into the pandemic and yeah. so if, if anybody forgot about that, remember, this is what it sounded like when Fauci was asked if someone should get a vaccine if they were already infected with COVID. Take a listen. Okay. Will people who have already had the virus be recommended to get the vaccine as well? The answer is yes. If somebody has already had the virus, should they still get vaccinated? Absolutely yes. People say, I've already had COVID. I'm protected, maybe even more protected than the vaccine alone. Should they also get the vaccine? It's conceivable that you got infected, you're protected, but you may not be protected for an indefinite period of time. We strongly recommend that even if you have been infected, yeah. that you get vaccinated. What about President Trump? He's already had the virus. Should he take the vaccine? He has likely antibodies that likely would be protected. We're not sure how long that protection lasts. So to be doubly sure, I would recommend that he get vaccinated. If you are infected, recover, and get one shot of the vaccine, your protection doubles what it would be if you got two shots of the vaccine and were not infected. The best protection is getting vaccinated. There's no doubt about that. I mean, we've obviously mm. beat the hell out of that narrative. It's one of the primary goals mm. of the high wires to make sure people actually know the truth. From the dawn of man, we know that natural immunity is stronger. How they've gotten away with this, there's never been a vaccine ever, not one, that worked better than having, you know, gotten through the natural infection. But it didn't matter, right? I mean, they, right. they still just keep plugging this full on lie. Vaccine immunity is the best immunity. That's where the words are out of his mouth. And remember, yeah. during during this this pandemic response by the media, they labeled anybody talking about natural immunity as someone worthy to be censored. This is LinkedIn. Uh, you know, you're normally a platform that's more of a job seeking platform for professionals. LinkedIn blocked links to natural immunity data. This was uh, uh, Robert Malone's. Uh, uh, a LinkedIn account was was completely deleted several right. times, and then he, he got it back. And then uh, Johns Hopkins, Marty McCari, and then even Instagram here. This is the headline: In uh, Instagram fueling conspiracy theorists by banning the natural immunity hashtag. So they're they're kind of linking it up with a conspiracy theory at that point. And then you started seeing op eds, you know, as it was being released, and they could talk about it. Op eds like this: the high cost of disparaging natural immunity to COVID, where the a national conversation started to get going. But 
you know, I guess the theme of this whole segment here is how do we actually lose sight of the actual science? You know, we talked about that with the with the suicide increase. We knew all this was happening even before COVID. And so let's listen. There's a rare there's a rare little time capsule here from 2004 with uh, Tony Fauci, and he he was being asked about a flu vaccine. Take a listen and compare it to the clip you just heard from him. She's had the flu for 14 days. Should she get a flu shot? Well, no, if she got the flu for 14 days, she's as protected as anybody can be because the best vaccination is to get infected yourself. And so she if, not she get re- it? if she really has the flu, if she really has the flu, she definitely doesn't need a flu vaccine. Next, if she really has the flu, she right. should not get it again. No, she doesn't need it because the, it, it's the be- it's the most potent vaccination is getting infected yourself. Hmm. That thing's going viral. I know it is. And for those of you that see that for the first time, and it's so shocking. Anybody, there'd be people out there say, well, he's talking about the flu. Now, let me just be perfectly clear. Now, he's talking about the flu, but he's talking about a flu shot, which has been around forever, something they know a lot about. This COVID vaccine, they knew nothing about, had never been injected into human beings before. So to be making statements that for the first time ever, a vaccine is going to be better than natural infection when you knew that is not the case historically of any vaccine. He just said it, not me. You're certainly not going to jump to the conclusion that it's the one you never tested for safety, never tested, don't really know if it works, 95% effective, now it's 80%, now it's 70%, booster number two, booster number three. Mm -hmm. Last week we talked about booster number five. Clearly they knew nothing about how bad this vaccine was going to be, but it is never, is certainly not the one that has bypassed natural infection. And now we know, once again, I mean, what's so shocking, when we showed that in 2005, His own NIH knew that uh, hydroxychloroquine was the best drug against SARS coronavirus back then. This guy literally just changes the tune. I mean, he just, whatever it is to sell us something or to push a pandemic or an agenda, it doesn't matter what the truth of science that he even knows, he'll change it on a dime. And having reported on this for two years, watching what he said, it's the truth is literally an inversion of what he has reported. So he said in his first clip there that the the vaccine immunity is the best immunity because we don't know how long natural immunity lasts. Well, it turns out that the the vaccine immunity only lasts a couple months. That's why we're on five and six boosters looking down the barrel of those for the American public. So that that's that's a truth. And, you know, whether it's whether it's the, the lockdowns or Fauci or even the CDC, there's a, there's a reckoning that's coming. It's really understood that they they screwed up big here. And this is this final headline, just to throw this in here, restructuring at the CDC. This is now, you know, across all of the mainstream media. CDC, under fire for COVID response, announces plans to revamp the agency. So Walensky said she's hiring a, a federal official from outside the agency to kick Walensky's off one Walensky's month- hiring. Walensky's hiring. I want her to be <laughs> exactly. the first one fired. That moron needs to be out of there. Come on. How good are we going to do when you have the same, like, idiots? Now they're going to hire more idiots underneath them? Oh, my God. The CDC is doomed. (laughs) <laughs> can we can we trust these people? Why why do they still have jobs? Why are they still getting paid by the taxpayers after this terrible terrible effort that they gave and all the damage in the in the, in the process that they they called terrible terrible calls? You know what's amazing about it, Jeffrey, is they might have gotten away with this. If, honestly, I think about it. If the high wire wasn't here. If we hadn't done this, done this work and had a big enough audience, all of you out there watching that started sharing with your friends and were a part of this massive growth, then they still would have had really virtually all of the airwaves. They had them the whole time. Four billion dollars spent by President Biden mm-hmm. to shut us up, to shut you up, but it didn't work. The high wire and others like us, but I think we really sort of led that charge of providing the evidence and the science that people held in their hands. They took it to their doctors. They stood defiantly against this. And now, you know, we are seeing a reckoning. They're obviously, when the Washington Post and, and, and Wall Street Journals and New York Times is start really turning on a story that they produced and they put out there, it is so clear what effect we've had here, both on the high wire, but all of, also our audience and all of you out there that were a part of, of this army of truth. Uh, We've made a difference. So, Jeffrey, it's fantastic, the work that you've done. And normally we have to sign off here and I say I'll see you next week. But I'm actually going to see you in just a few days because you're going to be in Los Angeles for the Defeat the Mandates uh, rally, aren't you? Absolutely. Absolutely. We need to stop this in California, like we've been talking about for a couple of weeks here. This this COVID response is not done and it is it is being 
attempted to be supercharged by ten billion dollars uh, in the Senate to keep it going. So this these these bills in, happening in California they cannot happen in other states. Um, this this thing is this thing needs to be stopped there. So I'll see you I'll see you in California. Well, there you have it, folks. Everywhere I go, I show up at these rallies, and it's like, yeah, we're glad you're here, Dub. But what about Jeffrey? Why doesn't Jeffrey come out? So all of you Jeffrey Jackson Fan Club members, he's going to be live in person in Los Angeles. I'll see you there, Jeffrey. Looking forward to it. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Dell. All right. Defeat the Mandates rally. Share the poster with everybody. DefeatTheMandatesUS.com. This is it. This is the final push. I already know you're going, but how many people are you bringing with you? Let's make this massive. Uh, this is our chance. It is so important right now. We have the wind at our backs. Let's just go ahead and clean this entire mess up. Let's just get rid of the entire disease. Don't leave a couple of cancer cells off there in the distance, hiding in the corners, retreating, trying to rebuild themselves into a disease that'll take us out. It's time to absolutely chemotherapy and burn it all out of there. I'm not a big fan of chemo, but you get the point. All right. So when we think about this pandemic, so much of our discussions have been about the, the failure of the vaccine. We've also talked about the denial of life-saving drugs, including hydroxychloroquine, ivermectin, and, and other things. And of course, intravenous vitamin C and all of these other things that people have used. And we've discussed it. We've, we've talked about the sort of the mandated ventilators and the remdesivir, and especially the fact that rem, you know, the ventilators were killing nine out of 10 people throughout this pandemic. And you know, Dr. Kyle Seidel, I'm just reflecting way back to a show we did. This ER doctor came out and said, this cannot be right. He was in New York working in all night shifts saying, we are just killing people with these ventilators. Well, what happens when you have some of that information and you're out there in the middle of the pandemic? So many of you were calling the show saying, I don't know what to do. They will not let me near my loved one. We were going to, I'm trying to get them ivermectin or I'm trying to get them hydroxychloroquine or I'm trying to make sure that they don't vent them. And the hospitals were like these prisons that they had taken your family member in and you were denied access. And so many of our parents were lost and grandparents throughout COVID um, when we weren't even able be, we weren't even allowed to be standing by their side when it took place. Well, this next story is a story like that, and it needs to go into the annals of time, into the time capsule that reminds us how messed up this experience was. How many doctors and nurses were anything but heroic, but actually helped divide families to bring harm, to not protect this is one of those stories. Here's Chewbacca. Nora's Chewy. Grace was um, phenomenal. She loved everyone and she loved everything. She was my best buddy. Uh, she went hunting with me. We got her a red convertible when she turned 18. Yeah, it was just a joy. We'd get out on the highway and she would say, let her rip that. <laughs> and so we, we would. We found out that uh, we were blessed with Grace having Down syndrome when she was born. Down syndrome is actually um, the presence of a third um, 21st chromosome, which she called her love chromosome because everybody that knows a child with Down syndrome, they just love unconditionally. Down syndrome did not stop Grace whatsoever. There wasn't a thing she she didn't do. She rode horse, she played violin. Uh, my wife, who's gifted in teaching, taught her how to read and write. The things that Grace taught me um, were really above and beyond whatever I taught her. I say thank you, thank you very much. Grace and I got COVID around the same time and Grace was doing great. She really was just having symptoms of a cold. We were monitoring her oxygen every day with uh, uh, oxygen meter. Grace's oxygen level was just below 90 and we assumed that that means check into the hospital. So we took Grace to urgent care and they did a complete blood analysis and measured her inflammation markers. Her D-dimer was greater than 5,000. So the emergency room physician had thought that we should admit Grace to the hospital and they did a CT scan because of that D-dimer score and her CT scan was negative. So thankfully she didn't have clots, but he said, it's, we got to monitor you very closely on this. We never would have considered that this is a dangerous place to put her in. 
The first day was great. We watched a couple movies and, and goofed off. The second day was October 8th. At 8 o'clock in the morning, a doctor came in and said, you're going to need to put a, your daughter on a ventilator in the next two hours. And I said, what is that recommendation based on? And he said, we did a blood gas draw last night. And it shows that she's in bad shape. So I said, I'd like you to retake the, the draw. So they did, and Grace was fine. What they did subsequent to that was they asked us four different times for a pre-authorization that if they decided Grace needed to be ventilated, they could do it. And obviously, we weren't going to agree to that. It didn't make any sense. The third full day, the start of the, that day, a nurse came running in and said her oxygen saturation is only at 85%. And I thought, this cannot be, it's impossible. So I had my own oxygen saturation meter in the room. So I put it on Grace's finger and it read 95%. And I said, is my meter accurate? And she said, yes. I said, well, why, why is my $50 meter more accurate than your $50,000 meter? And she said, the leads get sweaty. And I said, if you know that, why don't you proactively change out the leads every three or four hours or whatever it takes, given this is the primary statistic you are using to manage my daughter's care. And she snottily responded, you should just be thankful you caught this. On Sunday, October 10th at seven o'clock in the morning, the head nurse came in with an arm guard and she said, you need to leave immediately. And I said, well, what's the reason? And she said, well, you've been shutting off the alarms at night and I said well that's because I've had the nurses train me how to shut off the non-essential alarms I said they're going off constantly 20 30 times a night and we've got to get sleep I mean Grace has got to get sleep to get well and so then she said the, the second reason is the last three shifts of nurses don't want you in the room obviously because I was challenging the the protocols that I was seeing so I called an attorney friend and he said, Scott, just leave peacefully. And I gave Grace a hug. Yeah, you know, I could just see in her eyes, she was sad. And that's the last time I saw her. Grace was alone in the hospital for a total of 44 hours. My wife, Cindy, couldn't be the replacement advocate because she had COVID. We had to negotiate because of the hospital wanting to follow COVID policy, their internal policy versus the law. And Grace had a right to an advocate under the Americans with Disabilities Act. So they denied the advocacy. And that's when we got a lawyer involved to get my daughter Jessica as a replacement advocate. I had no idea what was going on in the hospital. The communication was so poor. No, no doctor or nurse came to me and said anything they were doing. I had to overhear what they were saying. So they were just making decisions on their own without even communicating with Grace's power of attorney, which was my mother. The doctors weren't giving Grace much hope. Just said that if Grace doesn't keep a good oxygen level, she may go downhill fast. The doctors uh, had four days prior to Grace's last day had put her on a sedation med called Presidex. Every med has a package insert. Presidex package insert says, do not use for more than 24 hours. They had Grace on it for four days. It's an anesthesia drug. The anesthesia drug is meant to only be used for three hours. I was really panicking and talking to Grace and just letting her know I need you to be a fighter. We need you here and we need you to stay here, you know. Grace's last day is so horrific. Starting at eight o'clock in the morning, the doctor called Cindy and I at home and made the comment about how great of a day Grace had the day before. He was a very smooth talker. His purpose of calling us was the fifth time that they wanted us to give the pre-authorization for a ventilator. And we said no again. So she's on max dose of Presidex starting at 5.46 p.m. They gave her a dose of lorazepam. 5.49, another dose of lorazepam. And at 6.15, a dose of morphine as an IV push. They gave Grace a combination of meds that none of us could have survived. It has a black box warning that says to not combine those drugs because it causes death. If you use morphine, they're supposed to monitor the patient and have the reversal drug bedside, neither of which they did. I was always touching Grace's hand. I was always holding her and she didn't feel right to me. 
So at this nurse, I asked her, I said, does Grace feel cold to you? She feels so cold to me. She said, no, she doesn't feel cold to me. And I couldn't tell you how many minutes went past, um, but she just didn't seem right yet. And she felt even colder. I tried finding a pulse, I couldn't find a pulse. I lifted up her eyelid and I saw her eyes roll back. And I knew something wasn't right. So I went out and snuck my head out again. I said, you know, I need help. Since someone come look at her, like what's going on? Her, she's not doing well, her numbers are going down too. So I instantly got my parents on the phone. At 7.20, Jessica called Cindy and I on FaceTime, panic. He said, Dad, Grace's numbers are dropping like crazy. I said, get the nurses in. She said, they won't come in, I've been trying. So Cindy and I holler through the phone, save our daughter. They holler back, she's DNR, do not resuscitate. One of the nurses read off the computer that the doctor ordered Grace to be DNR and they can't do anything about it. Well, there was roughly 30 to 40 nurses out in that hallway. No one, no one at all lifted a finger. She was so drugged up. We didn't even see her take a final breath. And I just watched her fade away. We watched Grace die on FaceTime at 727, seven minutes later. Our life without Grace is very empty. We lost Grace, but we also lost, we lost our future with Grace. When Grace died, everything stopped. I miss everything about her. When nighttime comes, I struggle. I struggle a lot because she's not there. It cuts deep to your soul. An incredible injustice. Uh, I'm joined by Grace's father right now. Scott, I want to thank you for joining us. As you watch that story, I know you've told it many times. What are your thoughts right now? Dell, it's, it's, it's a tearjerker. I can't, I can't describe what it's like to watch this live. It's hard to, it's hard to take. It's like reliving it over and over. Um, you, you're a, your team did a phenomenal job putting that together. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you for sharing the story because it, you're not alone. Uh, our phones are, you know, have been ringing off the hook with stories like this, trying to find lawyers to intervene to, to get to these loved ones. Um, as you tell the story, I think the thing that stands out to many of us is this odd obsession with ventilation. Did it strike you as it was taking place that there was something unnatural about their desire to be able to ventilate your daughter in an emergency? Like at any point, you were so available, they can call you at any time if it gets to that point. So they, you know, why why do they need to to be able to ventilate? What were you thinking about that? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, when we entered the hospital. I would have had the ventilator paradigm that most people would have had, which, you know, at the beginning of COVID, President Trump, I think unknowingly was promoting that we have a ventilator shortage. And so I just thought, well, I mean, a ventilator is part of the, the puzzle for the cure. And thankfully, when the doctor on Grace's second day said that you have to put your daughter on a ventilator in the next two hours, and I challenged that, um, and then he redid the blood gas draws. And I asked him then, what is the prognosis if somebody goes on a ventilator? And he told me close to the truth, which he said only 20% of the people on a ventilator walk out alive. I found out subsequently it's closer to 15%. And most of the people who are put on a ventilator during COVID uh, die within the first year because of the damage it does to their lungs. But what really clued me in is the nurse that was his assistant at that time when he was in the room started crying. And after talking with her, I found out she had a daughter named Grace and she knew that if I made that decision, then Grace was going to die. So now instantly I was educated on ventilators. And then you know, after Grace died, as, as you know, I've spent hundreds of hours researching and found out the why behind the ventilator push, which is, you know, of course, a money trail. So now, of course, I'm very wise to it, and I share it with anybody that I can. 
Yeah, we've had several doctors. Scott Jensen, who is sort of up north up there, uh, a senator, really spoke out about this, how they were being paid, paid first to say someone has COVID. And then in, in many cases, the number I heard was like a $26,000 bonus to the hospital once they put you on a ventilator. Uh, there's also bonuses to drugs. So tell me about, as you lay out this drug program that they put your daughter on, you know, I, all I'm thinking to myself is, was she in a car accident? Did she lose a leg? What, did she take a bullet to the chest? I mean, why, you know, why these heavy duty, you know, morphine and she's suffering from a cold. She needs oxygen. Why are you going to, you know, shut the body down at that level? Does it, ha has anyone made any sense out of that for you? Not the why. I mean, ultimately, only God knows the why. But as I keep drilling this down and learning from other doctors, we have an intensivist who wrote me after reviewing the records because an intensivist is a doctor who specializes in med combinations. And one of the attorneys suggested we needed to have an intensivist. Anyway, he reviewed the records and wrote me within a few minutes and said, Scott, the the meds killed your daughter. And we're talking about the three meds that were given. Grace was on max dose of Presidex, then given two doses of lorazepam, and then morphine as an IV push all in 29 minutes. That would have taken anybody out. The doctor who helped us review the records, when she was done, she wrote me and, and even crossed into intentional. She thinks it was intentional because it's so crazy. And so, I mean, we don't know why, you know, I'd, I'd like, I've speculated on why, but we don't know why it just, it, it isn't, we know it's not an accident because a 14 year ICU nurse is the one who delivered the meds. Did they, what was the final, if you don't mind my pride, what was the final cause of death that they wrote on there? I mean, what did they say she died from? They said two things. One is COVID and the other one is um, respiratory distress. And, you know, ultimately, because they listed COVID, they received the $13,000 government bonus, which, of course, if Grace would have lived, they wouldn't have received. And the respiratory distress is, is just as you showed in that one um, um, statement, that summary that added these drugs together. That is one of the issues, respiratory distress. Right. There it says, look, look at this. The CNS depressants may increase the risk of respiratory depression, hypotension, sedation, coma, or death. This is what they're given. And as you said, not only are they not sitting by her bedside, as your other daughter is there watching over her saying she needs your help. They're like, no, sorry. Uh, if she's dying from what we've just done, there's a do not resuscitate order. Did you, did you agree to a DNR uh, order? Absolutely not. And the, the, the latest, I drilled down some more records. So uh, we've had the benefit of having a medical malpractice nurse at the, at the hands of Tom Renz get involved. And she reviewed all the records I had first and had reviewed with another doctor. And she said to us, Scott, there's at least a thousand pages missing. So she helped write up another request we received the, the extra pages and she was right on. There's 948 more pages. And I'm just gonna read right off of this. So I mean, you, it, it's so strange. So at 1048 in the morning on Grace's last day, she was at max dose Presidex, maximum. And at 1056, remember, we did not approve this. The doc, that's when the doctor put the DNR order on Grace, eight minutes later. After I saw this on Monday, I talked with an attorney and his, he just instantly said uh, they thought the Presidex was going to take her out. And so, you know, you look at this, it starts getting, um, I'm, I'm getting closer and closer to the intention side of what happened. And it just looks so strange because it looks like they had to put this DNR order in to cover the tracks because obviously they did not want to save Grace. They violated seven state statutes by putting the DNR order on Grace. And the last one was when my wife and I hollered, she's not DNR, save our daughter. That overrides any DNR order and they refused to come in and on top of and come in the room. And on top of that, they had an armed guard posted outside the room. It, it's just so strange. I can't even imagine the the honestly anger I would feel and, and the, the rage and the frustration 
Um, so, so you're bringing a lawsuit. Tell me, tell me what does a parent do? Unfortunately, because you're not alone. Luckily, you know, by the grace of God, I haven't had to go through a situation like that. The, the, you know, we're brought some really incredible challenges in life. But there are people watching right now that have gone through a similar uh, situation. So what are, what are the steps you're taking in the aftermath of this horrific event? That's a great question. So I'm going to walk through it big picture and then touch on a lot the lawsuit idea. So, you know, the step, the most important steps are getting right with God. And, you know, thankfully, before we started getting the word out here, uh, we had done the research, we sent it all to the hospital, uh, requesting a meeting. I thought that was my biblical responsibility to meet the people who did this to Grace. Because we mm -hmm. shortly, within a couple of days after reviewing the records, we knew uh, they killed her. So then we took the time, wrote everything up, sent it all to the hospital. And then on December 2nd, they wrote us back and said, we're not gonna have a meeting. So that opened up the door for us to, to share the message. So during that time, I had to come to grips with forgiving them, which I mean, there's there's no way a dad or a mom or anybody, you can't forgive that on your own. God had to work in my heart to do that. And thankfully he did. So now I can, you know, I can research this objectively, tell the story, and then look at the idea of a lawsuit objectively. So, you know, from the perspective of, you know, a lawsuit, you know, anger can produce a lawsuit that is, has vengeance as the motive. And we don't want to go there. You know, if there's going to be a lawsuit, we, we don't know that yet. You know, I, I've been um, introduced to Tom Renz. He took a, you know, he just took an absolute love to Grace, which was nice. Mm -hmm. And and he, uh, out of his own pocket, funded this medical malpractice nurse. So we have our arms around it. And it seems that Grace's case has got is so egregious. It's got enough things in it. There's there's an overabundance of evidence that it would be a great test case. But I'll just tell your audience from a practical side, there is no legal grounds. Uh, it is unbelievable how the state statute and the federal statutes have you tied up. So I'll just walk through this. Grace was an adult. She was 19 years old. So the normal lawsuit theory is under loss of companionship. We have no loss of companionship because Grace was an adult by state statute. So then the next situation is medical malpractice. And that has a similar limitation, but medical malpractice has a limitation in Wisconsin of $750,000. Most states have a limitation like that. So I, when we were, were walking through this process, I asked, what's the purpose of the limitation? And I was told the doctor's lobbies have the limitations in place because otherwise doctors wouldn't practice if they had if they didn't have yeah. some immunity from liability. And so then the, the um, so $750,000 limit, I talked with the, a referral that they considered the best medical malpractice attorney in the state. And so he told me, Scott, even in slam dunks like this appears to be, you only have a one in 10 chance of winning. I said, well, what's the reason? He said, and he gave me an example. He said, I had a case where the doctor sewed up a sponge inside the patient and we lost. Mm -hmm. I said, well, how was that possible? He said, we brought 10 expert witnesses and they brought a hundred. Right. So they circle the wagons. And then of course, as you know, they have immunity under the CARES Act. So, I mean, we have a, a small thread where we can, just a small gap where we can sue, which is Grace's estate. Uh, can can sue for pain and suffering. So if, if that's what we do to to promote a test case, so that we can use Grace's case to stop this foolishness, uh, you know, that's that's the angle that we would go in on. Well, you know, I know that those are decisions that you're making right now. Um, but uh, you're, the main reason you're here, and one of the reasons I, I met you when I was out there on the speaking tour, and you said, you know, you really just want to get the story out so that we can start making changes. People need to get involved. They need to, they need to know that these things are happening to people. Doctors need to know. We, and so, you know, you have a website. So tell me the things you're doing right now. And, and I understand you, you even have a, a, a rally or something coming up this week. So is this, 
Uh, this is the website, www.ouramazinggrace.net, if you want to sort of check in on the story and, and track, I would guess, you know, the decisions that are being made in Grace's case. Um, this is the website. And then you want to stage a, a bit of a protest, I guess, or something, right? Is that is that happening this weekend? It is. It's happening tomorrow morning from 9 to noon. And thanks for mentioning that, Dell. It's uh, it's pretty neat opportunity. We're calling it a memorial rally. Uh, the city of Appleton, so Appleton, Wisconsin, is is the city where Grace died, and she died at St. Elizabeth's Hospital, which is part of the Ascension System. Um, anyway, the city has been gracious. You know, we had to get a permit to be able to to have this happen, and they are closing off a street uh, right across from the wing of the hospital where Grace was killed. Uh, so it, it'll be fantastic. We're really looking forward to it. You know, there's a number of speakers. Uh, people who have had similar situations to us, uh, people flying in to speak. And so we're looking forward to it as a way to honor Grace. And, and um, we really hope that it can be used to, if God wants to use that to, to bring the people in the hospital to acknowledge what they did and repent, I mean, that would, that would be the ultimate justice and it would be fantastic. You know, um, Scott, uh, and for everyone out there, if you're in the area of Wisconsin or surrounding states, I think these are these are those important moments where we really can make a difference. We really can make the news. We really can make change by standing together. Of course, we have the huge event coming up this Sunday, but we're talking tomorrow. We're talking about Friday morning, uh, Appleton, Wisconsin. If you're anywhere in the in the area, go to ouramazinggrace.net for any information on this. And, and what do we, you know, what do we hope to achieve with things like this? What we hope hope is that a politician will listen, that our, you know, that our leaders will say, you know what, obviously we have to intervene here. The fact that these hospitals are so, you know, protected from liability, your average citizen is just not, it's, it's, you're up against a mountain, or as you said, the wagons uh, are all drawn around you. I want to point out that the reason we have moments like this is what we just saw happen in Florida. Uh, Governor Ron DeSantis has just uh, brought a new bill. Governor Ron DeSantis signs bill to guarantee visitation rights for patients and their families. Um, that's huge, right? I mean, that that's what you want to see happen in Wisconsin. We should all, and the fact, I mean, the fact that we have to have laws that state that you have to let me in to be a representative to to my my relative is insane. But we're at that point. Is that sort of what you would like to see happen up in, in Wisconsin? Is the government to get involved and say a hospital cannot ban you from the room where your loved one is is being treated? I, I would say that's a minimum, you know, so we were in the room and they still took out grace. Right. There's a lot, you know, there's a lot going on here, Dell, as you know, uh, we, we really see that, you know, Grace's case, as I've drilled it down, there's some specifics on her last day that are so crazy. Uh, she was strapped down to the bed for wanting to go to the bathroom, you know, just process that. You know, that was one of the hardest things for me to tell until an attorney friend said, Scott, do you think that you would have been strapped down to the bed? I said, no, I wouldn't have been. So I started digging that Sunday. I got up at three o'clock in the morning, went through the records one more time, just looking for Down syndrome. Because I thought, you know what? I think they strapped her down because they could. And in the 22 doctor's reports that were written during the seven days Grace was in the hospital, they referenced the fact that she had Down syndrome 36 different times. They also referenced the fact that she's unvaccinated, that she's Christian, that we're following the frontline doctor's misinformation campaign. There was such a bias toward her in our family that you think, how could she ever survive? So where is that even coming from? You know, Grace's story, you know, with everything you're covering, you see Grace's story is really just one sliver. Yeah. It's really a new angle that the government has in this in this mastermind agenda that they're they're pushing. Yeah, it's really um, 
there is a lot to this that is so suspect. And when you think about these discussions we've had, I won't get into it here, but when we look at many of the banking issues, Europe, you know, some of the specialists saying that Europe is about to go bankrupt. America is on the verge of bankruptcy. Pensions not being paid out. Disabilities costing the government. And it does almost seem systematic the way we've been putting elderly people on ventilators and, you know, handicapped and those uh, maybe that can't fight for themselves. So I, I really want to ta thank you for taking the time today, Scott. Um, our hearts are with you. Our prayers are with you. Um, I know that we can't bring Grace back, but I do know that we can make sure that this story of Grace's life is able to make a change so that others never have to suffer what you've gone through. And I want to thank you for your courage for standing up and, and, and using this instead of just, you know, letting it tear you apart, actually going out and trying to save others. It is what's truly great about humanity, and, and you represent the best of us right now, and I want to thank you for taking the time. Well, Dell, it's it's quite an honor, and realize that it isn't, it's God doing it through me because I don't have that strength on my own, and we are certainly hoping that this story pricks people's hearts so that they they realize that the government has duped them and they can they can turn to the only one who won't dupe them. And you know, that's that's really what this is is about. All right, everyone, once again, if you want to go to that rally or follow the story, the website is www.ouramazinggrace.net. Um, is that right? Ouramazinggrace.net. Yes, there it is. Um, and so really tr get out there. If you're in the neighborhood, these are the things that are important. Uh, it'll be a good warm up as you get ready to hop on a plane up there in Wisconsin and join me in Los Angeles. Scott, uh, my best. Send my love to the rest of your family and, and know that we're with you there tomorrow morning in spirit. Thank you very much, Del. I sure appreciate it. You bet. All right. Well, this is just another one of those stories why it's time to come together. This has been a disgrace, this entire situation, the way hospitals have handled this, doctors and nurses falling far below what's expected from them after having signed the Hippocratic Oath, which was to do no harm. Can you imagine writing a do not resuscitate order on a young person without even talking to their parents because they have COVID? She's not dying of AIDS. This isn't terminal cancer. She didn't lose her, you know, lungs in a car accident. She's going to recover in a couple of days. And this is a situation we do not resuscitate. All of this has to change. Many of these laws that are protecting these people are what are at stake in Los Angeles, it's what they want to bring to the rest of the world. So just to get a taste of a couple of the people and the ad that is now running in radio stations all over California, this is Defeat the Mandates. The world's biggest health freedom event is coming to Los Angeles on April 10th. Celebrities, athletes, influencers, and scientists including Jenny McCarthy, Kevin Sorbo, Lee Allen Baker, Del Bigtree. We are the leaders of the free world, and we are standing with our brothers and sisters who are marching like this all over the world. Naomi Wolf, Dr. Pierre Corey, and Dr. Robert Malone. The truth is like a lion. You don't have to defend it. Let it loose. It will defend itself. Don't miss it. Defeat the mandates, US.com. All right, we're all going to be there. Jeffrey Jackson's going to be at the photo booth. If you want to get a picture with Jeffrey Jackson, the ICANN's got, we're going to have a setup booth there. Uh, you can come down and meet Jeffrey. I'll spend some time there too. Uh, I understand there's like 40 different vendors uh, that are standing for medical freedom in California, around the world. You can meet them. Um, it's just going to be a spectacular event. And so I'm looking forward to seeing you there. One of the things we just talked about medical malpractice, how that's one of the issues that's going to be being discussed at this rally. The other issue is law enforcement. Uh, we've seen all of the, you know, defund the police situations, but also we we know that there's a law in Los Angeles. Well, here is San Francisco Mayor London Breed announces cuts to to police in new city budget, uh, forced vaccination of, of police officers uh, up and down California, 40 San Francisco police officers not vaccinated against COVID-19 placed on leave. I mean, at a time, and, and look what it's, you know, we've, we've talked about this, and now crime running rampant in cities all across America, governors screaming for help, mayors shouting for help, states of emergency, people robbing stores in broad daylight, all because, and we're laying off 
off, you know, officers, law enforcement, because they won't get vaccinated. Or if L.A. gets or California gets away with the law there, they, they want to be able to take and defund you. If you don't enforce the covid policies on other people, kick in their doors, arrest them, force them to be vaccinated. Well, in the center of this uh, was one such law enforcement officer, Joel Aylworth, who is joining me now. Uh, Joel, you were one of these guys in San Francisco. Vax mandate came along. Um, first of all, why didn't you take it? Well, uh, well, I'll tell you, Dale, there's a whole bunch of reasons. One is I've been following the high wire for about two years. <laughs> so right. uh, that, was, that was one. And I always give uh, thanks and grace to that because I was way ahead of the game uh, in that sense. But also just being a Christian and having those sincerely held Christian beliefs, religious beliefs, you know, we we just we don't abide that the body is within the holy spirit the temple of the body the the blood of christ and putting unknown biological substances in our body is a form of pharmacia that we don't subscribe to so what was the response when this mandate came about and i'm sure you know you were alone obviously many of things was there it said 40 in that in that area uh were laid off um, did you did you file for an exemption? What was the process? Was that allowed to you? What took place there? Yeah, so several events happened. Right in July, the city came out with this. They wanted to mandate the vaccine, but they did offer religious and medical exemptions. Um, so many of us filed for those exemptions. And it's interesting, that number 40, just so you know, it was close to about 300 at one point that had filed for exemptions. I and about 150 other officers were were fast in applying for event, uh, exemptions early on, and those were approved. So August 19th, I actually have I submitted my exemption. You can see it up there. Yeah. And uh, 820, I believe it was on um, the 20th of August, it was approved. So it was approved within a day. And many of us, about 150 of us, had that. Midway through, about a month goes by, September 10th or so. The public health information officer of San Francisco said, you know, masking and testing and all this isn't going to be enough and we're going to mandate the vaccine. Now, what's really interesting about that is then they forced all of us to do a secondary review, even though it had been approved. So they had us go through this ridiculous secondary review, which asked asinine questions like you know are your kids vaccinated uh, you know there it is wow. right there you know did you do your do your children get vaccines what i think is a absolutely is overstepping uh it's a violation seven. yeah I mean, yeah a amen i mean your hip rights these are your medical records your children have nothing to do with your job yeah and then on top of that they asked some other interesting questions if that i don't know if your producers have i know they have that form but it was things like do you take tylenol or tums i mean these questions were were ridiculous and we knew where they were going because like i said 300 of us initially filed for religious exemptions or we're in the process but 150 of us had got approved they knew and i heard rumblings the city attorney and someone else got involved there are 150 outstanding and so they knew they couldn't deny us all at once. So they had to group us all together by offering this secondary review. And the secondary review, guess what? All of us got denied somehow, our religious wow. exemption, apparently. And the number that I that I have is about a thousand. And you can see, look at that. It's just, it's arbitrary. There's not a thing. They don't just point, all of us got the same thing. Every checkbox was checked. Accommodation, you know, uh, was an undue hardship to the department. We pose a direct threat, all these things. And uh, all of us got that, and there's about a thousand total. Now SFPD, I believe there's about 300, but about a thousand uh, total religious exemptions that got denied um, in a very arbitrary sense. I, we don't know why. You know, it's, it's scary to me because I think when I look at sort of the overall scheme of things, you had uh, you had the president of the United States promoting mandating uh, of a vaccine on adults. It's the first time it really ever happened. Going after our jobs, of course, luckily it lost to the Supreme Court uh, when it came to large employers, but healthcare workers and things like that uh, fell under this, this uh, mandated vaccine. But when I look at this law now, one of the laws we're really fighting, and, and my understanding is, is actually just yesterday, Senator Pan has had to put it on hold because it's not popular, but it, they want to force law enforcement 
to have to, you know, uh, uphold whatever, rec- you know, whatever the violation is. If it is, if the health department says you have to kick in people's doors, then the law enforcement has to do it. If it says you have to turn off the power, then they have to do it. Like whatever it is, it basically makes the police department, the law enforcement are just, the, you know, are, are being puppeted by the health department. And in this law, if they do not adhere or uphold these regulations from the health department, they're defunded, the money is taken from them and given to that health department, giving them even more power. And when I think about like, and maybe I don't know if you've gone this far in your thinking or if you can, or, but when I think about why is it you wouldn't want anyone on the police force not vaccinated in the beginning of this pandemic when you need them, it sure seems like if you really want, you know, I don't want to put it in bad term, but goons working for you that will just do whatever you say, get rid of all of the free thinking police officers that represent, that see the unvaccinated as their brothers and sisters. They've got to be taken out. We need just the ones that fall in line, already have this thing, and then go and we'll do whatever it takes to force everybody else. Do you feel like that's a part of it, just to sort of call the the, the free thinkers out of the department? You know, it's interesting. I mean, clearly it, it, it appears that way. Um, I would hate to say that anybody that got, you know, forced to got a, a vaccine, you know, wasn't a free thinker. I can tell you, um, but, and you've done a lot of a great job with the psychology of this. And you can just go back to like Nazi Germany and stuff and, and nothing to say against that time period. But we know like what, it was like 3% of them, not many people agreed with what uh, Nazi Germany's yeah. overall, what their, what, their, um, what their mission was, but they went along with it which is what you've been preaching this whole time on the high wire. Like we've got to stand up. And I know there were tons of officers. It's so heartbreaking because there were so many of us in this chat and, uh, you know, officers were, were texting and saying, I- I'm sorry, I have to cave in. I have, my wife is pregnant. Um, I'm, I just bought a house. Um, I don't know what to do. And so they were forced to get this vaccine and they didn't want to. And that was heartbreaking. But as you know, I think from a psychological perspective, they're they're using like a technique called like nibbling right and if you nibble and you get a little bit from somebody you can get a little bit more you can ask a little bit more and you're 100 percent right um people are when you're living in fear and you have to provide for your family you don't know any other way you'll do whatever it takes unfortunately even if it means doing something that you know deep down is wrong but you are creating a robot unfortunately that's yeah. just carrying out orders and that's what happens you get desensitized to this and you're just like well i'm carrying out an order and that's what I'm doing. Yeah, and and let me just, you know, I probably was a little bit harsh because I would imagine there's there's plenty of people that say I want to be able to protect people. And if I have to sacrifice my belief in my own health in order to continue to protect those people, I know there are those that that, that many probably just tell them themselves that as they go through with what they don't believe in. What effect has this had on law enforcement? You must still have friends in there. We're hearing really catastrophically low numbers when it comes to being able to handle the plight of big cities and the issues of modern, you know, uh, policing. Um, are, are they strong? Are they furloughed? Or, or are they in real trouble? They're, they are they are devastated. I've been in contact with a lot of, you know, good friends and, and officers in the last week. And, um, you know, they, their morale is at an all-time low. And, and morale is, comes and goes, so that is what it is. But, um, yeah, crime is soaring. I mean, you've got a malicious district attorney that is out, like, actively, like, looking to prosecute cute cops and and not criminals. Um, and so I can say also for this, you know, we know the media spins things all the time and they are completely lying when it comes to the staffing numbers at SFPD. They are at the, their all time low. I mean, for when I went to SFPD in 2013, I transferred from another department. It was booming. We were running five academies at once, which is a lot in a year if anybody knows about being in the training division. Five academies, 50 students at one time they can't even get like 20 students. And you have to remember, um, 50% of students usually pa- uh, fail the academy. It's just, mm. it's, it's a challenging nine months academy. And so yeah. you're left with like 10 that actually make it to the street and then another five that might not pass field training. So uh, officers are being called in for one of the first times in history. I'm sure it's been done before, but they're being called in on their days off. They're being forced mandatory. We've never seen that uh, in the history of SFPD. People are leaving in droves and, they, that was one of the most sought after departments. When I first got into the SFPD, they said, you, will, you might leave this department, but they always come back. 
and they were right at that time because it was just a great place to to work and a fun 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 environment but that's not the case uh, anymore what does this do to the personal lives what happens to your life since you stood for what was right um you stood for your health your health matters if you're going to try and protect the rest of us how did this affect your life my life, like many others, uh, it got turned upside down. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie and say I, I'm the kind of person. I want to just say that I'm, a, I'm the kind of person who is the glass is always half full, and that's the way I think. So I'm never gonna let this negativity or what they're doing to me um, hurt hurt me. And and I'll tell you when during this time, I mean, I was living in fear just like everybody else. What am I gonna do? Should I should I you know forge a fake vax card so I can keep my job? But deep down, Dell, I knew that wasn't right. And it didn't align with who I say I am, my higher self, the highest version, my true self, and what I align with. And I said, absolutely not. And I want to be that force for other officers to stand tall and and be there so that light so that they can lean on that. We need to build that momentum. Mm. And I will say this, you know, I, I had to do some soul searching. And um, I remember when I in this time, I, I asked myself, man, what, what what's the worst that could happen to me? What what am I scared of? What's, what is Joel really scared of? I'm scared that I'm gonna lose my house. I'm scared that I'm gonna lose all my money. And at the end of the day, I got a smile came on my face because you know, you know what? I realized they can't take my integrity, they can't take my soul, and they can't take my happiness or my health. I, can, I know how to make money and I can always make money again and I'll figure out a way. And that was invigorating and that brought me back to life and that's what I tried to instill in other officers. But I will say this, just like me and many others, we were, we were forced to move. I mean, I was a San Francisco resident for the last 10 years. My wife is a born and raised. And if you know anybody in San Francisco, there's a lot of pride that comes with being born yeah. and raised in San Francisco. They will tell you that they're born and raised. In San you will find out within the first minute that they were from the city. And, uh, you know, she, we live two houses down from my mother-in-law and my sister-in-law and, our, and my, my, my boys, they're eight and four. They have two cousins that they would see every day. Mm. And we had to leave the, we had to leave the city, you know, that we lived there for the last 10 years. And like I said, my wife was born and raised there. So she lived there even longer. Um, and many families, I'm not the only one, many yeah. of the 40 SFPD officers that you know about have had to move to various states like Texas, South Dakota, um, to, to escape because they've been forced out and it's been, it's been really, really sad. What are you doing now? What did, what did you do? What did, so how did you bounce back? What is, what are you up to now? Yeah. So, you know, um, I, I leaned into something that I've been working on over the last six years and that's health and health coaching. And, uh, you know, I, I've been studying under naturopaths for the last six years, really, because my mother got sick. She had breast cancer and my mother-in-law had thyroid issues. And it made me sick to my stomach that I couldn't figure these issues out, being a pretty healthy person. And so I went on this journey studying under various naturopaths for the last six years. And um, I finally launched my coaching business because I thought, oh, cool. this is the perfect time. And maybe this is the time that I need to do this. And I launched my podcast over two years ago. You know, you, you, uh, you, you graced us on that podcast last July, um, bringing a lot of awareness to that, to, to what was going on. And so, um, I'm really living that, uh, in that point of, uh, purpose and passion. And it is scary. I, I always say this all the time. It's really scary, but I just keep leaning into abundance because I know the more that I do that, that that's what I will manifest. And that's the exciting thing going on. That's right fantastic. Now. It's exactly the message I've been bringing throughout COVID. I know they're trying to force vaccinate you. I would say to large audiences and you're saying how I'm going to feed my family. And I said, you know, you're worried about your job, but most of you hate your job. In your case, that's not the case. But I said, there's some dream you have of something you want to be doing. Now's that time. Instead of sacrificing what you believe in, sacrifice your body, live into your dream. I think that that's what's going to be born out of this. This, this incredibly horrific, stupid time we've been through is, I think, you know, a better world ahead. Just lastly, as we're preparing for this rally in Los Angeles and the idea of tens of thousands of people. And by the way, you know very well the, the hoops we had to jump through to get the sheriffs to allow this permit, to get the police officers. And one of the things that was really, I think, fortunate for us is how many of them believed in our message, recognized that we are out there standing for their right to choose what, what they're going to enforce, to not be forced to, you know, bring enforcement on COVID masks and things that they don't believe in. So many of the sheriffs standing up for freedom of choice in, in our constitution around this country. Um, so I think there was a benefit there. But when you think about all those people standing out there, what does that mean to the police officers across the country and the healthcare workers and those that are working? Do you think it makes a difference for us standing together like that? 
1000%. And I'm going to tell you why, because in San Francisco right now, the tonality is that there is no hope that, that this is just the way it's going to be. And I can tell you, you know, I frequented Idaho over the last two years. And every time I would, I'm literally just an hour flight away. And you know, it's a completely different vibe. People are walking around like there is no COVID. So I, I think what people need to realize is that there is, and I like to talk about this idea of oneness and that we're all connected and we don't realize that we feel like we're alone, but we're not. And events like this bring us back together and make us realize we are all connected and that we all really want the same thing and that there's a big group of us and we get to, you know, come, there's camaraderie in that. And I'll just say this, Dell, we didn't talk about this, but you know, the SFPD April 15th mandated the booster. And then guess what? They backpedaled just this last week because why? Because 600 officers didn't upload or update their status. So that just shows you the yeah. power of coming together and unity. There's 2,000 officers at LAPD that are also fighting this with religious exemptions, and LAPD's done nothing. Do you know why? Because they know they can't afford to lose 2,000 cops out of a 10,000 cop organization. Right. And that's what it's all about. And these events bring that awareness that we're not alone, that we're in this together. We're all one. We definitely are. Joel Aylward, thank you for your words. Thank you for, you know, your energy, man. I mean... I just think, God, thank God we got you off the street. I mean, God forbid you're walking around, you know, big smiling face, taking care of protecting our children, our families. But obviously you're on to bigger, better things. Once again, that website, uh, if you want to check out the work that Joel is doing, here it is. Let's bring it up, folks. Here we go. JoelEvanCoaching.com. www.JoelEvanCoaching.com. Joel, take care. Thank you for taking your time to join us today. Joel, one last thing, if, I, sure. if you don't mind. Is, uh, and I, I'm glad, thank you for bringing awareness to me and my own cause and my journey, what I'm doing. I, w I really want to highlight in SFPD and in the city of San Francisco, we have a fight on our hands and we are trying to, you know, raise money with the, with the American frontline doctors or so they're doing some amazing work as okay. you know. So if people can go there, sfrights.org backslash help, we need all the help we can get. Um, you know, these lawsuits are expensive. Yeah. ICANN does an amazing job, which is why I donate every month. Thank and uh, we're just asking for a little bit. These lawsuits are anywhere. One lawsuit is about $200,000 yeah. and we've raised 75,000. So um, any help, if anybody can help us with that, um, we're motivated and um, we are starting to finally feel like we're, we're winning and that we are going to do well. We're confident we'll win. We just need a little support. So if anybody has it in their heart, even if it's just $25, man, it goes a long way, as you know. Absolutely. All right. Glad. Let's put it up one more time for everybody that went by really quickly. www.sfrights.org slash help. This, look at, you know, there's millions of you out there watching this show right now. You can't all get to the rallies. You can't get out. But this is where you get to feel good. Do a little bit of good today. Let's help those uh, that are helping us, that are protecting us, and are in the fights of their lives. Uh, Joel, uh, I look forward to speaking with you soon. Take care. Likewise, brother. Thank you. All right. Uh, well, as we sort of end this, I've got so much to prepare for. I got packing to do to get ready to go to Los Angeles. But as I was thinking about this event, of course, Washington, D.C. was amazing. It was amazing to see those crowds out there. But a moment, um, there have been several. Of course, the release of Vax for me to, to first see those theaters open up in New York for the first time. And then a huge moment in Orange County, California. Uh, where we showed up for our first screenings in California, and there was literally lines out around the building and down the block as far as you could see. A topic that everyone said was dead. No one would be interested. Uh, and, of course, uh, my team is made up of uh, Kat and Pat Layton, who were part of you know, getting those theaters and moving those people out and, and having lines around the block for multiple screenings. Uh, they became fast friends and the work that they did there actually helped spread the movement all over the country. They're now involved here at the high wire at the highest level, making all this happen. I said, you guys know how to get it done. We're all helping and pitching in on the rally. And it's that sort of coming together that really makes a difference. And I don't think, you know, prior and, and, and I think L.A. will probably end up, you know, being the pinnacle. But when I think of a moment that shifted everything, um, it really it all went down in New Jersey. We've talked about it before, uh, but I want to revisit it as you think about what is the importance of gathering together 
course, I'm talking about what we refer to as the Battle of Trenton. They were trying to take away the religious exemption. New Jersey being the heart of Merck, where the Merck plants are at, and Johnson & Johnson. This literally was the belly of the beast when it came to pharma. It seemed like, you know, everyone in politics is beckoning to the lobby that got them into office. But they never expected the crowds that showed up. I was there, and I will tell you, this day, for those of us fighting for freedom, felt like the World Series. Jersey strong! 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 The head of the police force here said in 20 years, I have never seen this many people show up for any issue there has ever been. Every single one of you is a leader and every one of you is my hero. Thank you for being here. You are setting a tone like no other I have seen in the history of my whole entire political career. There is an important battle going on today. They want to attack your religious liberties. They want to attack your parental rights. And they want to put chemicals inside your bodies without your consent. And we need to stop that. This is such an important moment. This is not just a fight in New Jersey. Today you are fighting for the entire United States of America. You have to know that whether they vote yes or whether they vote no, the science is crumbling down around them. And God help them. God help them if they're the last politicians that ever signed their name to a document to enforce a product where all around the world the science is crumbling around them. We will stand together and we're going to win this fight. What is the big rush about this issue? If this were truly about an issue of public health, why would they allow anyone or any private entity to be exempt? Are we going to say that only the affluent, only the rich can opt out of the vaccine program? And leave, leave African Americans and Latinos and everyone else hanging in the balance even though they've read the same science, even though they want the same healthy kids. We love our children, we love the future, we will not give in. I want to just tell each and every one of you what a privilege it is to serve in this great state where this many people took their concerns directly to the state house. We know that what's going to happen inside this building is it's going to get ugly and they're going to do every single thing, every dirty trick they can to turn this around. We need you guys to stay with us. Are out there 
we can hear you out there. You guys are singing, you are praying, and um, you are being heard. So please stay, continue to fight. We're not going away. 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 And what we're hearing is what really rings in there is when we tell them to kill that bill. So kill, kill that bill. bill. Kill. It went down in Trenton, in the belly of the beast, we have won. This is our time. If not us, then who? If not now, then when? I mean, I, I still get choked up. Uh, being there, you really can't imagine what it's like to be a part of an experience like that. Every person being so vital to making a shift. And we killed that bill. And ultimately, we killed Sweeney's job. He lost his job in the next election. Uh, and the tides turned. Inside of the Capitol, while we were all outside, was a very, very important player. Jamel Hawley was an assembly member at the time. Um, he joins me now. Uh, former assembly member and Democrat, which is, you know, tends to be rare on this issue. While we were shouting outside, you were hitting uh, the floor, talking to everyone. Sweeney was dragging people off, threatening them, promising them everything. It was a heck of a battle that day. Uh, what was it like inside as a politician hearing? I heard that you could hear the voices ringing through the, the, the halls of the Senate there. I mean, Dell, thank you so much for the opportunity to join you today. And I do have chills as I'm watching that video. Um, and that's what I heard originally was the voices outside. It was a magical moment. And I've been in that state house um, practically half of my life for 22 years. And I have never witnessed uh, that amount of people, that amount of excitement, um, the cries, the tears, uh, the children, um, who were out there from the morning all the way until nighttime. It was a magical moment. And I think that it will be the best medical freedom moment in time, because I think that that pivoted the conversation across the world uh, when we defeated uh, the bill in the state capitol in Trenton, New Jersey. And to you and to so many others who came across the country, we thank yeah. you because there were parents who were just asking for one simple thing. Just allow us to have our own parental rights, allow us to make our own medical decisions. And we fought hard and we won. And thank you and to the audience and to all the medical freedom advocates across the world who watched New Jersey that day. Um, it was an incredible moment, Dell. It's something I'll never forget a day in my life. Yeah, I'll never forget it either. I know so many watching right now remember that moment. Watching that video brings you right back there. It really, I mean, honestly, I blew out my voice that day. It was everything we had. We felt like we left it all on the field. I know you were blown out inside. But one of the things that really stood out to me, it was the, and I, and I said, when I, I think I was interviewed by some news camera, I said, this whole game has just changed. And they said, why? Because the amount of people. I said, well, yeah, the amount of people. But you know what we saw today? I think when we were out there and some of them appeared, there was like four or five senators and assembly members that came out and stumped, like gave speeches to the audience. There were several that were running for office that had never run before that were reaching out to the audience uh, to get votes saying, I'm going to stand with you. And it was the first time. And I said to everybody, I said to my team when I got back here, I said, this game just changed. We just became a voting block. We became important to politicians. They now 
now need us. Uh, and so to understand, help me understand the politics around this issue. Why has it been so hard to have this conversation on what should seem so obvious, which is a right to choose what's injected into my body, a right to decide what goes into the body of my children. It just seems like such an obvious fundamental right. What is it we're missing? How is it that so many politicians not even are not aware of it? They won't even open their door to hear from the constituents. They won't even have the conversation. What's going on that we're not aware of? I mean, Dell is big pharma. I mean, it's the fight that we've been having with them from day one. Uh, the pharmaceutical companies are very powerful. They have tons and tons of money. But I think that what we've been able to do in Trenton and your voices and many across the world, and as we're having this rally, I'm looking forward to it on Saturday. I think what we've been able to do, and I've been a part of many movements, Black Lives Matter movements in terms of criminal justice reform. I've been a part of LGBTQ movements. I have never been a part of a movement so powerful as the medical freedom movement. And it has become now a one issue voter issue. And yeah. I think that that is very powerful. And if if anyone didn't see New Jersey's election results last year, I think that that wave is definitely coming across this country this year and future years to come if elected officials don't move away from ensuring that parental rights are restored to give them that ability. If they continue to try to uh, take po parental rights away or medical freedom rights away from individuals, they're going to start to pay at the polls. And New Jersey was a learning lesson. I don't ever think that that bill will come up in the history of New Jersey. I don't think that any medical uh, freedom bills that are going to take away rights uh, from individuals are going to come up in that state house um, and probably never or any years to come because it has become a one issue voter issue and they're showing up at the uh, election booths. Uh, and I think that's very important because yeah. as a human and as someone who, you know, has advocated for rights of individuals, no government, no pharmaceutical company should even entertain any type of legislation that's dealing with the removing the rights of individuals at all. And I'm very proud of this movement and they should continue. And I'm looking forward to uh, California this weekend. Yeah, me too. And, and speaking of California, and, and I, I want to keep talking to you, but I understand we've got Pierre Corey. One of the issues that you deal with as a politician is you're not doctors. And, you know, you're just being told all the doctors agree with us, that you're going against medicine, you're going against the doctors. It's hard for a politician to make that choice. One of the big changes that has happened is these world-renowned doctors that are getting out and fighting. They're on the front lines now fighting for medical freedom. It's really what's behind, you know, this rally to defeat the mandates rally. And so I understand Pierre Corey is just running through the airport right now. Um, I think, uh, okay, I think they're, they're sort of getting him locked in right now uh, somewhere. <laughs> Have you just hop off a plane? I want to talk to him uh, before we lose him because he's a big part of what's happening here. And here we go. There he is, <laughs> Dr. Pierre Corey, live from the airport hey, in Los Angeles. How you doing, man? I'm all right. I just got off the plane in L.A., Dell. All right. Well, you know, FLCCC obviously is, is where the donations are going through. You're a huge part of making this rally happen. You know, I know you, you've just arrived there. You know, what is the feeling? Are you excited? What, what do you think is going to happen? I am so excited. I mean, listen, my experiences with the convoy, I mean, that, that, is, that is the people. That is America. Sorry about my camera here, Dell. I'm, like, screwing up. Um, there we there go. There we go. Right there. Stay right there. Listen, Dell. everyone's showing up. You know, that's that's what I want. You know, the people's yeah. combo is blue collar, white collar. All of America showed up. They showed up on overpasses. And we got to see this again in, in California. I mean, you see the legislation that's going on. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. And, and we got to yeah. stop. These mandates are not stopping. I mean, they're lifting the mask. But... There's still a lot of stuff going on. The healthcare workers, my wife, who's a doctor, she's going to lose her job if she doesn't get a booster. These boosters are insane. I mean, they're not working. And I, I know I, these I lockdowns think and all Cor these restrictions didn't work. And, I, and we're tired and Del, of it. I think especially Dr. as a doctor. All the, you know, we can't, we, we don't have the autonomy and the freedom to take care of patients the way we want to. It, it's got to stop. 
Absolutely. When you think of the, you know, go ahead, Jamel, you want to jump in there and talk about what, what, yeah, what I, what I was saying, I think Dr. Corey is right. And I mean, I think we need to pay attention to California because that's where it originally started, right? When, when these bills of these mandates and these medical, uh, and, and religious exemptions, uh, bills started, it happened in California. Then it went to, to New York, then Connecticut and all these democratic legislatures. And I was a Democrat at every state talking to my democratic colleagues about how we need to stay away from these particular mandates so dr corey is spot on we need to pay attention to california and that's going to be my message on saturday Dell. is one thank all the advocates right because yeah. we've been through a, a tough time over the last few years but we need to re-up and re-energize for a new fight coming on hand because it all starts in california Absolutely. and it just spreads throughout the legislatures throughout the country Great point. Dr. Pierre Corey, I know I've only got you for a couple more seconds. You're there. I know I'm going to see you on Sunday. You have a big event coming up tonight, though, that people can check out. Just tell me about what's going on tonight. Yeah, I'm going to be on the uh, Vaccine Safety Research Foundation call uh, talking about, you know, my practice, my, my what I've learned and how I treat the post-vaccine injured and, uh, and what a calamity is. I mean, it's an epidemic of it. I mean, COVID cases may be down, but we're still left with just this this you know, this remaining huge part of society that are still suffering debilitated, whether it be from long haul and post vaccine, and no one's addressing it. It's not really a thing. It's not being described. It's not being published in journals. And, you know, all of us out here trying to help these patients, we're doing the best we can. All right. So that's at vaccsafety.org. You can check that out tonight. Tune in. These are the best in the world, folks. I mean, this is what for many of us that have been in this fight for so many years, you know, back when we were in Trenton, we were all alone. Dr. Pierre, Corey, you've brought a whole other, you know, conversation to this. Uh, true science, true medicine, standing in, you know, uh, the scientific method. Of course, Dr. Malone's joining us uh, in California and a whole host of other uh, brilliant scientists and doctors. Before you sign off just a last thought to anyone that maybe is sitting on the fence whether or not they should be in los angeles i don't know why anybody would be questioning that now but what do you want to say uh, to our audience out there i mean just remember what america is about we're about freedom and independence and autonomy and and we're individualism and we you know we're in a, we're in a society right now that's overrun with mandates from every strata of society from the individual to the children they're going into the children with the vaccines they're restricting doctors they're coercing people to do things to keep their jobs and employment. I mean, this is a really important time in history. And if there's ever a time to, to rise up against what really is medical tyranny and for health freedom, now is the time. So please show up. I mean, we got to do something. I mean, we can't just let this keep going without, without pushing back. The people have to speak. Amen. Uh, and you have uh, been speaking a true hero uh, uh, and uh, and really putting it all on the line and know what it means to be a doctor standing in there, attacks on people's licenses. We get to hear you speak, most of us, on Sunday tonight. If you want to check them out, at vaccsafety.org. Definitely check out uh, that uh, Zoom discussion. Uh, Pierre, I'm on my way to L.A. I'm looking forward to it. I think it's going to be lit up, man. I think this is going to be huge. All right. Travel safely. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Del. See you soon. Bye. I mean, how important is that, Jamel, as a politician, that there are now world-renowned scientists? These are not just, you know, some fringe guys, guys like Dr. Robert Malone, that are walking into politicians' offices and talking about the science, uh, and they're empowered to do so. Um, what kind of difference is that making to this conversation as you feel the pulse, especially as a Democrat, right? I mean, I, 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 I'm politically marooned. I w was a lifelong Democrat, Robert Kennedy Jr. The three of us get together scratching our heads. How is it that environmentalists don't understand that you are contaminating the rivers of your body? Uh, you know, when we think about toxins, you know, what's happened to this conversation as you start to talk to politicians around the country? I think it's opened up a lot. You know, when you had the big lobby like pharmaceutical, they bring their doctors. But now the medical freedom movement has now brought our doctors. And so I think that that has made a tremendous amount of a good, um, a good push for us uh, in terms of getting our messages out. And I think more, more elected officials are listening. Dell, they have to, because elections are being lost. And the one thing that an elected official cares about is whether or not they're gonna get elected at the next election. And so because of this issue, as I mentioned to you earlier, 
the medical freedom movement has placed itself as a one issue voter issue and the doctors have been very helpful and the more and more that can have the courage to come out uh, would be great all over the country if we can uh, because they need to continue to get into the ears of these elected officials and it's working let me tell you it's it's definitely working as unfortunately as a democrat we've lost members uh, on the democratic side in, in the assembly it's very sad to me to see some of my colleagues who i work very closely with over the years but if you don't pay attention and you don't listen to those voices that are outside that state houses they're going to find themselves outside of the state house and that's exactly it just lastly as we think about you know i, I think it was roughly five thousand people in trenton which was huge it's one of the biggest rallies we've been at we're expecting tens of thousands uh to be there in california uh, when you think about the legislators in California and really around the country, as you said, I think they were walking blindly. They didn't, they didn't realize this was a, a big enough issue or that was something to focus on. What does all of us standing together in that moment, what does that say to politicians? What effect does it have? Because I think sometimes we feel so powerless and who can I vote for and does my vote matter? But standing in front of the world, that makes a difference, don't you think? It does. I do. I do think it makes a difference and it's going to cause a red flag. And that's a good red flag um, because they need to pay attention and they need uh, to listen. And as I mentioned to you before, Dell, all they care about is the next election. Yeah. And so the more and more uh, individuals that we can get out there, they hear you and it's working. And I encourage anyone who's listening or on the fence of coming out or who wants to continue to get involved, please get involved with Dell and ICANN and the High Wire and so many of the medical freedom movements in each state. We're, we're in every state, Dell. This yep. has spread throughout the country and I'm very proud of, of this movement, but do not feel powerless. Uh, do not feel like your voices are not being heard because not only did we stand up uh, for our medical uh, choices, we've now uh, organized throughout the country and we're changing elections, Dell. All right, fantastic. Jamel Holly, thank you for taking the time. I know you got to go pack. I'm going to see you in Los Angeles. Pack. One of the amazing <laughs> speakers that's going to be speaking um, at the Defeat the Mandates uh, rally in Los Angeles. Uh, so glad to have you on our team. It's amazing to think back in the days when no politician would talk to us. And now you're here. You're going to stand on stages. There'll be other politicians there uh, standing up, people that are getting in. And by the way, folks, you know, get into politics. One of the ways we shift this and, you know, you can all we can all sit there and bitch and moan about how it's a swamp out there. Well, the way you clean that swamp is you get involved. You got to you know, start joining your school board, start you know, running for senates and assembly members. I mean, that's all it means is you're a concerned citizen. That's that's all it is. We've got to get our voices in there. Jamel, you're one of those guys that, you know, stays in there. You keep fighting for us. Um, I look forward to your future as we watch you rise uh, throughout the political system. And it's amazing that you're bringing a voice to Democrats. That's so important. I look forward to seeing you in Los Angeles. I'll see you soon, Dal. I'm going to go all right. pack. All right. <laughs> all right. <laughs> see you soon. It's going to be amazing, you guys. Um, lastly, as I sort of close up this show, there's a video when you talk about the politics. And, and for those of you who've been at this for a long time, some of you are brand new. Welcome. We're glad you're here. I get it. COVID was such a disaster. You didn't see all the disasters before. You didn't see all the vaccine injury. This is a brand new world to you. But for those of us that have been here for a while and all of the, you know, basically eyes rolled back in their head politicians, this video just shows you how far we've come. It also is a very powerful discussion about how dangerous, you know, in, in what a precarious position the United States of America now finds itself in. The types of views and moral compasses of those that are supposedly leading us, the things that they're questioning. Just listen to this conversation that happened. This video is going viral for a reason. Let's just summarize this for the folks back home. We've got a bill here, as Chairman Nadler says, that's going to set up more bureaucracy to go after domestic terrorism, and that, that's probably a good thing. And Mr. Biggs has offered an amendment that says you can't use the funds that are going to be authorized in this bill to investigate, analyze, monitor, or prosecute any individual who's declined the COVID vaccine or expressed opposition to it. This should be, this is constitutionally redundant, this amendment. 
It is <laughs> obvious on its face. And, but it's not being kicked out by the chairman or anybody else here for being non-germane because it is germane. This should terrify you. This amendment is germane to the bill because the FBI has already indicated that your opposition to taking the vaccine or to spreading information that might be true but the CDC doesn't agree with will qualify you to be targeted as a possible domestic terrorist. You're definitely a domestic terrorist. So, listen, was when the CDC changed the definition of vaccination, they changed the very definition of vaccination. If somebody had the gall to point out that that goes against 250 years of medicine, of science, the redefinition of vaccination, should that make them a domestic terrorist? No. This, this amendment is spot on. The CDC has, has been involved in the past two years trying to cover up something we've known about for 10,000 years, natural immunity. What if you dared to say that I trust my natural immunity to protect me from the next infection of this virus? Should that, what if I dared it? Okay, maybe I have said that for two years, but that shouldn't make you a domestic terrorist, come on. Why would the Democrats be opposed to this amendment? I don't know. Some have, some have said, well, the language, it should, there should be a four where there's an and or something like that. Well, let's fix it then. Because the fact that this amendment is germane is terrifying. The fact that we even need to mention this amendment is terrifying. The fact that moms are going to be targeted as domestic terrorists because they think their five-year-old doesn't need the freaking vaccine because they've looked at the at the data and they don't they've seen that the flu presents more of a risk to their child than COVID does any of the variants does that make that mom a domestic terrorist what if i mean it's it's ridiculous the, the that that the democrats are even opposing this it should be adopted by unanimous consent if they have some problem with the language then let's fix the language, but let's not label moms domestic terrorists for saying they don't want their child to get the vaccine. Let's not label expecting mothers domestic terrorists because they say, I want to go ahead and have my baby before I get this vaccine. Because there's, this data has not been out there, this vaccine. By the way, it could just as easily say, you can't, be a, you can't be labeled a domestic terrorist by the FBI for refusing a medical treatment that only one of three corporations are allowed to provide in this country. With no liability. In other words, if you don't accept a medical treatment for one of these three giant corporations, then you could be a, you no could be a, a terrorist. Yes, and, there's, and this is the other thing. Joe Biden has said the, the only uh, industry that's immune to prosecution or, or immune to liability is the gun industry. That's ridiculous. They can they get sued all the time for defective products. But who doesn't get sued? Who never gets sued for a defective product? Who's got emergency use? Who's got the PrEP Act? The vaccine manufacturers. Yep. Does that make me a domestic terrorist for saying these facts? It shouldn't. And this amendment should be adopted. And I yield back the balance of my time. I mean, it is so astounding, the shift that has happened in this country and around the world. And for those of you that have been watching the High Wire and sharing the High Wire, that have been at all the rallies that I've been at, my brothers and sisters out there, so many of you, we see each other over and over again. Give yourself a pat on the back for what we have achieved here. We have moved the needle. We have moved this giant freighter. It is now turning. We've got the tugboats pushing in the right direction. We found the soft spot. This thing is moving. It's not over, but that's only the fun. The fun is now the fact that we've got the momentum. We're moving faster and faster and more powerfully, and there's nothing they can do about it. Now, politicians are stumping for us. I have a feeling some of these guys are watching. Watching and, and women are watching the high wire at home. What a powerful testimony there. But listen to what he's saying. The fact that we're even debating whether we should have an amendment that says the FBI is not allowed to investigate a mother that is simply speaking out that she doesn't want the vaccine or that as a pregnant woman, she doesn't want it before she's pregnant. It is horrifying. 
And I want you to know right now just what Jamel Hawley said. We need more guys like Massey there in the Senate, in the Congress. I'm an optimist. I don't know if you've noticed that. I'm an optimist. People keep saying, well, I mean, we just, it's a swap. We'll never get through it. Dell, I mean, can't tell me if people told me five years ago, you'll never be able to stand up against the pharmaceutical industry. Dell, they own everybody. They, they own the t TVs. People close to me, why are you going to make a documentary? All you're going to do is destroy your television career. Well, I boldly said and proudly said that the last rally in Washington, D.C., yeah, I left my job at CBS, and now I have more viewers you here watching than I did when I was working for CBS. So we are making a change. It is not a time to sit around and de be depressed and sulk. Or if you remember the Sky News executive last week that said, we're looking to America. You're our only chance. You're the beacon of light and hope. If America goes down, we all go down. Do you feel that in your veins? Do you feel how important we are right now? Go ahead and push away any sadness or frustration you have. We are winning this. This is our time. We are Americans. We are a part of the world. We are standing for our brothers and sisters, and we're going to do it powerfully this Sunday to defeat the mandates rally. I'm going to be joined by amazing musical guests. Dickie Barrett's there. Jimmy Levy in high res. Five times August. Grant Elman, Joseph Arthur, and Sonic Universe. We're all coming together, politicians, celebrities, athletes, doctors, scientists, every race, religion, and creed, every age, children, mothers, grandparents, standing together for the most important thing there is, freedom. If you want to hold the line, come to Los Angeles, because that's where we're going to be holding that line. I'll see you there. Hold the line And overtime on the front lines We are police in the cities And firefighters, we're protecting the families Kicked us to the curb for the shot we refuse It's our body and our right to choose of the system will build a better